elsewhere. It is simple and brutal. A person can get used to anything, even to killing. It was with a hunter's pride that I pulled the raft up to the lifeboat. I brought it along the side, keeping very low. I swung my arm and dropped the Dorado into the boat. It landed with a heavy thud and provoked a gruff expression of surprise from Richard Parker. After a sniff or two, I heard the wet mashing sound of a mouth at work. I pushed myself off, not forgetting to blow the whistle hard several times to remind Richard Parker of who had so graciously provided him with fresh food. I stopped to pick up some biscuits and a can of water. The five remaining flying fish in the locker were dead. I pulled their wings off, throwing them away, and wrapped the fish in a now consecrated fish blanket. By the time I had rinsed myself of blood, cleaned up my fishing gear, put things away and had my supper, night had come on. A thin layer of clouds masked the stars and the moon, and it was very dark. I was tired, but still excited by the events of the last hours. The feeling of busyness was profoundly satisfying. I hadn't thought at all about my plight or myself. Fishing was surely a better way of passing the time than yarn spinning or playing I spy. I determined to start again the next day, as soon as there was light. I fell asleep. My mind lit up by the chameleon-like flickering of the dying Dorado. Now this is an interesting story for a number of reasons. I want to go uh, really quickly to paragraph 35. This is where we're going to start. And we're going to start this time at 3a, our relation to other titles. Standing behind the life of Pi, and, and even this cutting, is this notion of how it relates to another survival story. And I just want to um, read this line, the feeling of busyness was profoundly satisfying. The great writer Defoe writes a famous novel called Robinson Crusoe, um, where we have a very similar notion that if you are in a situation where you're all alone, you've got to figure out a way to stay busy. And that busyness has got to be very intentional. Now let's go through this reading really quickly, and more particularly the idea of the first kill. The idea that you get slapped by a fish instead of the tiger is the first great kind of sudden epiphany. That is to say, he's got all these fish flying around, and some of them end up in the boat. Using that fish, of course, he's going to be able to survive and obviously feed Richard Parker the tiger. But notice that we've got a problem here that is a fundamental moral problem for him. It is, if you will, an ethical dilemma. That is to say, he is a vegetarian and he has always lived believing in the sanctity and sacredness of life. Here he is now in a survival situation. He's going to have to take the life of a fish. Now, for those of you who fish all the time, this is no big deal. But let's go back to the very, very first time in your life when you recognize that that fish swimming through the creek water was usually caught by somebody who's an adult maybe who's teaching you how to fish that you had to take that life and that killing or that taking of life has to be a sacred act for Pi. He sees it as a sacred act. Likewise as well there is the whole notion of how Richard Parker will consume a fish on paragraph 19 on page 206. He even talks about pure animal confidence, a mix of ease and concentration of uh, being in the present. Now this idea of the yogi who is able to be aware and in the present will carry some serious weight as, of course, the novel will move forward. Of course, here in paragraph 21, he is learning deliberation. He's learning intentionality, right? And in a survival situation, we, we have to be learning all the time. Of course, there's a certain sentimentalism that can allow him to kill the fish. Ultimately, he'll break the fish in paragraph 24. And about that in paragraph 24, 25, he will weep by paragraph 26 heartily over this poor little deceased soul. This notion that he has now become a killer. Guilty as Cain, he will say. 16 years old. Why is it that it's such a big deal? Those final lines in paragraph 26 I want you to mark. All sentient life is sacred. And he says it. I never forget to include the fish in my prayers. He had blood on his hands, he says. But now, of course, there is the challenge 
to go ahead and to catch a larger fish. Now, the Dorado is a beautiful fish. I hope you Google image this so that you know, have a, have a better sense of what it is. Uh, uh, this one is a three foot long fish for him. He's got to get on it and ride it. Ultimately, notice he will be working against nature. By paragraph 31, we have this dealing fate a serious blow, engaging such a handsome adversary. That is to say, now he's fighting with it. And then once it happens, he will thank Lord Vishnu, one of the, one of the gods of Hinduism. Thank you, he, he shouts. And of course, this notion of being able to save himself, and obviously Richard Parker, right? By paragraph 32, notice it's no problem for him to kill. So even in the short little uh, reading, he's moved from weeping about breaking the neck of a little flying fish to now killing the Dorado. Uh, and of course, that notion of the beating of a rainbow because of all the majestic picture, um, colors right that are a part of this. And then finally, he is sanguinary. He is happy about this um, kind of thing. It is simple and brutal, he determines by the end of paragraph 33. A person can get used to anything, even to killing. And of course, this is that observation because of the survival mode. Ultimately, he will feed Richard Parker, and then we will finish with the idea that he was still excited by the end of it because he had accomplished something great. Well, obviously, it's for, at uh, level 2A for themes, messages. Jot down for you, what's the major message here? Overcoming the challenges in a survival situation that are deep challenges, deep-rooted challenges, obviously are necessary, especially if you're going to continue to survive in a situation like this. you got to eat something, taking the life of a fish. That's the important message though, right? It isn't the taking the life of the fish, or in this case two fish, but rather respecting all of life, okay? At to be, notice the, the sentence structuring. I just want to, I mean, we could play this game all the way through, but I just want to go to paragraph number 29. Notice the line, he's, he's catching the Dorado. The line cut into my hands. Notice the punctuality of, this, of these really short lines. I wrapped my hands in the blanket. My heart was pounding. The fish was as strong as an ox. I was not sure I would be able to pull it in. Notice how this reading, this moment of this reading, helps you to kind of get a sense of what it's like to be in this moment with this fish. He's fighting against this fish. That is to say, note the rhetoric of the way that um, um, we'll have this written. Uh, will help us to get a sense of the urgency and the excitement even of what happens. At 3A, I've mentioned Robinson Crusoe. Jump down how this reading works with all of the other readings from Unit 2, our survival unit. What, how is it similar in so many ways? Having to overcome obstacles, obviously a huge part of that, no question. What are the movies for you that play similar kinds of games? And obviously Life of Pi was a film, and you should uh, maybe take a look at it. It's quite a remarkable film. Finally, at 3B, for you, what is the challenge that you've had to go through? Where when you finished on the other side, you had done something that before you would have probably said, I don't think, I don't think that's something I could ever do. And then you do it. And then you're kind of excited, you're kind of proud about it because you've done it, you have survived. Well, I hope that this will lead you maybe to want to go on and read more of this amazing novel. Thank you.